I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Randy Schultz got bitten by the bug his senior year of college. He wanted to be a journalist. But not just any journalist. He wanted to be a big-time, big-city newspaper journalist. There was only one problem. Randy was gay and out, and in the early 1970s, there was no such thing as an out gay journalist at a mainstream big-city newspaper. But Randy was determined and fierce. By the time I met him in 1989, he was the leading journalist in the U.S. covering the AIDS crisis. And he had two books under his belt. The Mayor of Castro Street, about Harvey Milk, the assassinated San Francisco City supervisor, and the award-winning bestseller, And the Band Played On, a gripping history of the early years of the AIDS epidemic. But in his adopted hometown of San Francisco, Randy's unflinching coverage of the AIDS crisis earned him a lot of critics. Early on in the epidemic, the city's gay leadership bristled at the unwelcome attention they feared would derail the community's political progress. And when Randy called for the closing of the city's gay bathhouses as a way to slow the spread of HIV, he was vilified by those who weren't about to give up their hard-won sexual freedom. Randy was accosted on the streets and shouted at in restaurants. So here's the scene. It's the evening of Tuesday, September 12th, 1989. I arrive at Randy's modest but comfortably decorated house on Saturn Street overlooking San Francisco. Randy's hyperactive golden retriever greets me at the door with a cold nose and a wet tongue. The dog's name is Dash, after hard-boiled detective novelist Dashiell Hammett. Before I even have the chance to unpack my equipment, Randy is talking a mile a minute, interrupting himself, interrupting his own interruptions. He shows me into his living room, takes a spot on the sofa, and tries to get Dash to settle down without much success. But I manage to clip my microphone to Randy's sweater, and we're off and running. 69, I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. So Stonewall happened three weeks after I graduated from West Aurora Senior High School, Aurora, Illinois. And so, um, and then I was very, the only time, and this is what's so different now than than even when I was in school, is that, um, you know, you grew up with never hearing anybody talk about being gay. And the one time, I think before I was 18, I heard the word homosexual was in this incredibly enlightened context where my sociology teacher, who was the teacher I admired beyond all other teachers, who was so neat and really liked me, where she said, maybe they're not criminals, maybe they're just sick. And then she stopped, realizing that what she had said was hopelessly radical, and said, well, at least that's what some people think. You know, like, that was, you know, and I'll never forget that, because it was, I knew so well that I was gay then. And had, had, yeah, and had, oh, and had, you know, numerous sexual exploits and Boy Scouts and everything like that. So I knew it was very, so I knew I was gay, but, he, but of course, very self alienated about it. And then you hear that from somebody you admire, and that's it. Do you recall what you thought when she said that you were, you were just sick as opposed to a criminal? I think what I thought was that it was the most liberal thing that I'd heard at the time, too. That, gee, maybe I'm only sick. Um, but there are so many levels, you know, that your psychology works at when, you know, you're. You know, and sure. you're a fucked up 18 year old closet case or 17 at that time. And I left Aurora the minute I could, and at the end of 1969, and hitchhiked to the West Coast. And uh, with this woman friend of mine, and she had mentioned that there were lots of bisexuals in, on the West Coast. And so, and that was obviously a big drive for me to do it. And, but I was also a hippie, so I had my hair long. And was, smoking marijuana and listening to the Moody Blues and reading Herman Hess and doing all the things that, you know, staring at the three-dimensional album cover of Satanic Majesty's Request and all oh, that sorry, stuff. That... The three-dimensional cover of Satanic Majesty's Request is a Rolling Stones album that had a three-dimensional cover on it that you get stoned and stare at and see the little pictures of the Beatles in the corners. And so I fell into the counterculture in, in Portland where I lived and was very hippie, but still couldn't bring myself to come out. It was just still, it was this taboo, and it was violating this taboo that I couldn't make myself do. I had no links to my home, to my family. You know, I was very independent, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Were you in school at the time? Yeah, I was at the, I, I had to work my way. My parents were pretty poor, and we were very, because I was a hippie and they were very conservative, we were estranged for two or three years and mm -hmm. didn't talk. So I put my, I had to work my way through college and went to a community college for two years. And it was in my second year of community community college, though, that I came out that I had my last heterosexual affair with my 
philosophy teacher. And one reason I had an affair with her was because in philosophy class, in every one of her classes, she would bring in uh, uh, people from the local Gay Liberation Front in Portland to to speak. And I figured, well, gee, I'll, you know. And so one of my attractions to her was that I could meet. It was <laughs> my my last heterosexual affair was just all a ruse to be able to get to meet other gay people. And then that was, and I met um, one of her gay friends who was in the Gay Liberation Group, and we, uh, and we, we talked, and, and it was the first time, it was just like in, in one week, I was able to put the whole gay thing, shift it from, from being my problem, and society is right, and I'm wrong, and I was able to really pretty much adapt the political analysis that, gee, I'm all right, it's society that's wrong. Mm-hmm. And so it was a week after... I met this guy and it was able to sort of talk about this stuff that I was teaching a class in um, anthropology, cultural anthropology. I was going to be an anthropology major then. So what I did was change it at the last minute and invited all my friends and then had uh, two women and then this other guy from the Gay Liberation Front. And then I was on the panel and I introduced the panel and said, we were all gay and we're going to talk about what it's like to be gay in America. So all my friends were there. (laughs) <laughs> and I told all my friends that day. I told everybody in my life that day, and told my parents within and and uh, with about a year later. Uh, yes, it was May nineteenth, nineteen seventy two. Mm-hmm. How did and, your class react? Uh, everybody was great. I mm-hmm. mean, everybody was real cool. I didn't lose. I didn't lose this. I only lost one friend. It was very easy. Everybody was very accepting. And then I moved to Eugene, and uh, the next fall I went to the University of Oregon, and I was. Um, I became very, just totally involved in the gay movement and was the president of Gay People's Alliance, which was, I think, the, it, that was formed in 1970. It was one of the oldest gay campus groups in the country. Which one is this? Which the gay, Eugene Gay People's Alliance mm-hmm. at the University of Oregon. How many people were in your group? Boy, we'd have meetings of up to 100 people. Most meetings had just 20 or 30. And the first meeting of every semester would be packed because everybody would come to see who else was gay. And then about 80% would disappear back into the woodwork of the school. And then... It um, sounds very familiar. Yeah, and that's... and the uh, But then we did a lot of rap sessions. And that was very crucial to my uh, integration, as I think, uh, in terms of integrating a positive self-image and, and, uh, and understanding. In terms of really talking out how... Our problems as individuals, being gay and accepting ourselves, how they related to a broader political framework of, of, of us within a society in which we were brought up to dislike ourselves and to doubt ourselves. And, and so it was just this real intense of talking. And um, so then we did things like put on the first gay dance at the University of Oregon. And then we put on the first, uh, it was the gay straight sock hop and it was all 60s music. And we, we allowed straight people and made, you know, we're very liberal. And then we did the gay pride program and did speakers and we had Morse Kite come up. and oh, you did. Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. Back to the dances just for a moment. Yeah. Were you, did you experience any resistance from the, the school over doing these dances? No. Mm-hmm. No, because I was very powerful in student government, so they really couldn't fuck with us. You had a very serious foundation as a troublemaker early on in your, yeah, your career. Yeah, yeah. Once I understood the whole gay issue politically, then it all fell into place almost right away, because it just gave me a political context to understand, you know, what was going on. Did you, um, did, must have decided at some point you were going to be... A writer, journalist. Well, that came very late, though. I was an English major by the time I was at the University of Oregon, and I was going to write great novels, and then I was, uh, but I couldn't write a simple declarative sentence because I was an English major, and they don't teach you how to write, they teach you how to read. And so then I uh, took a journalism class because a roommate said, oh, well, they're good, they have, they're good at teaching grammar. And so I took a journalism class just to learn grammar, and then I was so good at it, if I do say so myself. And I just took to it so well uh-huh. that that was in my fourth year of college I did that, and I stayed in an extra year and got my degree in, in journalism. And in November 1974, I got a William Randolph Hearst Award for a story about drag queens in Portland. And so I always wanted to write about gay stuff. And then my second award was another Hearst Foundation Award for a story about discrimination against gay people. It's called In Hiding. It's a very dramatic story where I interviewed all kinds of classic cases and, you know, prominent people who, you know, had to conceal who they were. In Portland. Portland, Seattle. So I worked real hard in journalism school and got tons of awards, was real good, got great grades, but was be, I'd been very out front about being gay. And uh, Did anyone say then, as, as was said to me when I was in journalism school, being out is going to really hurt your career? Uh, graduate student types were very blunt and just said, 
you know, you can't, you can't do this. You're just not, it's not going to work. You'll never have a career. And I was real adamant that I, w that I was going to be out front. And once you come out, on, especially in a very public way, the way I was and that, you know, so involved in campus politics and stuff that you can't go, it wasn't an option. So in Oregon, so let's say it's, so what happens is 75 comes, I'm about to graduate and I can't get a job anywhere. Did you send your resume I out? sent up my resume and people who didn't have grades as good as mine were, who didn't have my awards, who didn't have, you know, who hadn't done as much on the campus newspaper, they were getting job offers. And well, I that, wasn't. What that make you think? Well, it was just so clear that it was discrimination. And at the same time, I had, the, I had the, uh, because I'd won those two awards from the Hearst Foundation, I was rated as one of the top eight college journalists in the United States when I graduated. And so that was, they took the top eight college journalists and you participated in the National Writing Championship. I won second place in that. And then the night that we won, I took everybody out to the gay bar because it was here in San Francisco and I'd been here before. And then the next, and then they freaked out. The Hearst people freaked out. And, and then a few weeks later, they took away the award. They said they made a judging error, a thousand dollars, and they canceled the check before I could cash it. And um, it was so devastating because um, I realized then that I wasn't going to be able to get a job, and so I was going to make it as a freelancer. Because I swore when I got out of college was that I'd never make a penny except through my writing. And so that was my resolution that I stuck to. How did you um, get your first job? My first job was, uh, well, I was freelancing and I went to Portland and I was going to freelance for Portland Publications and, uh, and then for The Advocate. That wasn't panning out as a professional um, thing because there just weren't enough publications in Portland. So then I moved down here and The Advocate wouldn't give me a job but they more or less assured me that I'd be able to have $600 a month worth of stories. So I just came down here and worked my, and just devoted myself to writing for them, and then within five months then was, became staff writer at The Advocate. That was hired there in April of 1976, and then got to cover gay stuff, which was fine. I just, I thought it was lots of fun. I always wanted to work in the mainstream media, but it was a great, I was covering stuff that I liked, and it was a great training ground. Did it make you crazy, though, that here you were, one of the eight top journalists of your uh, in the United States. And I was writing for this publication that had all these dirty classified ads in it. That I couldn't send the publication to my parents that I worked for because it was all filled up with gay white men want somebody to piss on, you know? <laughs> and the uh, it was so embarrassing, you know, because it was... Sometimes I go back and read the little diary fragments I wrote back then. And what's really striking about 76, 77, 78, both is the ambition. I was really ambitious. And I just knew I, it was never a question of whether I was going to make it because I knew I was. And I just worked around the clock and every day of the week and, and was always freelancing something and, and working. But I just the anger, the rage, just the horrible rage. And then with me, part of my story becomes that I start drinking over it and stuff. And so that's a, because I think I, I was just probably born with alcoholism in my genes. But I think it came out a lot sooner than it would have. Who did you rage against? Well, so at the beginning, it was just this big nebulous them, you know, all the places where I couldn't get work. It becomes more specific as time goes on because I met the advocate and doing good stuff. And then I get my, my break, which was a big break, was in February 1977. KQED uh, had Newsroom, which was a nightly news show. And so they wanted to start covering gay stuff. They're going to be the first because nobody covered gay stuff. Oh, the Chronicle and Examiner, TV stations back then never covered gay stuff. It's like it didn't even exist. So uh, they were going to be the first people to do this. And so they wanted somebody who was openly gay to do it, somebody who they could say in a press release was gay because they knew that'd be good press. So anyway, so I got it. Even though I wasn't that, I had a horrible voice. And I'm not really meant for TV. But the... Um, you must have been thrilled. Oh, it was just the thing. I, was, I had arrived. The St. Paul Pioneer Dispatch, which won the Pulitzer on, for AIDS, you know, a few years back, assholes. But the, <laughs> they, uh, they ran a thing, Homo Hired to be TV Reporter. I probably still have that around somewhere. The ratings were miserable on the show, but strategically it became very good for my career because people in the news um, read it. So all the editors and opinion leaders and uh, you know in the news business got a sense of me real quick. My first story was about Harvey Milk, 19, February 1977, for a story about Harvey Milk in the District 5 race. 
I knew one thing about Harvey Milk that he was just this great story. He was just going to be the best story. And uh, because he's a char- he was a character. He was a character, and he was going to win. And it was so. Uh, and he was, but also he articulated a vision. He was an idealist. He was a visionary in the true sense of the word. And then the Castro Street was so fucking exciting. I mean, it was just so exciting to be gay and be on Castro Street. It was Why? just neat because it was we were going to create a new world. The new world, the new way of being gay was coming from Castro Street. So what was the new way to be gay? The new way of being open about being gay, of not having to be uh, hiding, of being powerful, asserting your power. Uh, when people, when gangs came in to beat us up, you know, we organized our own street patrols. And, uh, you know, that kind of responding, not being the sissies anymore. It was so different. And being butch and being, you know, the whole thing of totally recasting what being gay men in America. And we were doing it on Castro Street and the rest, and in the gay world, everybody else in the world was following us. You know, we created it. We were the Mecca. And so it was so uh, heady. And it was such, it was a great time to be a journalist because you knew that you were just, I knew I was writing about, and that's what, this gets back to my anger, that I knew this was so fucking important. And the chron- nobody was covering it. You know, they cover the news stuff about you know Harvey getting elected and stuff. And that's when because by the, once I'd been at the TV station for a while, it was clear. You know, everybody said I was a great reporter, and then because I come from a print background, so I did intelligent. You things. knew what a story was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was a different. Uh, it wasn't like a TV guy. And so the uh, and that was then the rage, you know, because <laughs> then I couldn't get a job. So I applied at the Chronicle and at the Examiner and everywhere. Nobody would hire me. I really wanted to write for the Chronicle. I really wanted to be in the mainstream and, and be back in print. And I did real. And then I started applying at TV stations. This was in 1978. My break came in commercial TV the week after the riot, that the riot happened after the Dan White trial. And they, everybody realized they needed somebody to explain this. So KQED, uh, no, KTVU Channel 2 let me start freelancing for them. And I freelanced that for them for about a year. Until I, uh, a magazine that was a short-lived magazine here called Boulevard's Magazine had a, the 10 most eligible gay bachelors in San Francisco. It was in uh, like May of 1980. And that was the number two after Armistead Moppet. And uh, the the news director saw that, freaked out, told my best friend at the station that it was a disaster for my career, that I shouldn't be, you know, you know that it's one thing to be gay, but you shouldn't talk about what you want in a boyfriend. And uh, <laughs> which you did in the article. Yeah. So of course that's what you do when you I do know, a most eligible bachelor. You know, better like rock and roll. And uh, <laughs> better like the Rolling Stones and something like that. And he didn't. He stopped using me. When you're a freelancer, you know, you don't get fired. you crazy. What well, was just so fucking weird? And then that was around the time that, uh, well, this is the whole, the big despair hits. Then the uh, the KQED newsroom, the news show got canceled in August of 80. So I went on unemployment. And then that's when I wrote the Harvey Milk book. Basically, because I didn't have anything else to do. Nobody would hire me. And so I just kept, so I did the Harvey Milk book, and then I finished that, and then just a few weeks after it, the city editor, they had a new city editor, or he'd been at the city editor at the Chronicle maybe a year, and he was, loved TV people, and I was, loved the show I was on, and hired me. Were you the first openly gay Chronicle reporter? I was the first openly gay news reporter in the country, except for a guy named Joe Nichols at the Post. Post had come out in Anita Bryan in 77. I was the first person who was hired as open, you know. So I, you know, whatever that distinction is. But That's certainly at the crime. Yeah, it That's is. But the, uh, yeah. And so that was in August of 81. And in fact, it's ironic because, you know, AIDS had been dis- detected just, you know, weeks before then. But I didn't start doing major stories. The big story that started everything and it was the in March of 83, and I talk about it in my book, that story where there's the study about one in 300 gay men in the Castro had been diagnosed with AIDS by then. Well, this is when everybody thought it was media hype and it wasn't real. And one in 300, now it's one in 10, had been diagnosed with AIDS. But then that was so shocking, I thought it was real important. And then I found out that the, all these gay leaders had had the study for two months. I hadn't done anything with it. Hadn't done anything to tell people about it. Oh, we'll release it through appropriate channels, which meant oh, the gay press, or they have to have another meeting to decide about it. And you know, and everybody's out there getting fucked in the bathhouses every weekend and thinking that AIDS is media hype, and they weren't releasing this information. So I wrote it up. And when I was writing that story, I had the president of the Alice Toklas Democratic Club called me up and said, if I print that story, they'll put barbed wire around the Castro. Um, people called up my 
book publisher, somebody called my editor at St. Martin's, Michael Denity, and had Michael Denity call me in San Francisco to try to talk me out of doing the story. And I mean, I got, did nothing but answer phone calls all day from people, the gay political leaders, uh, trying to get me not to do that story. What'd you tell them? I just told them I don't get paid to not write news stories. <laughs> you know, to me it was just so obviously the news value was there. And just their way, you know, and, and it was, oh, it just made me so mad, you know. And you see, and that's the thing is because, see, if I had been serving the what was then perceived as the political interest of the gay community, uh, I would not have written about AIDS in 1983. But for, from a journalistic point of view, it was so obviously a story. So that started it. And then, in 80, and then within a couple months of that, there was the big, the first bathhouse thing, which was the gay leaders had had a meeting with bathhouse owners and asked them to put up posters warning people about AIDS. And the bathhouse owners refused and just said, they walked out of the meeting. They said, we're not going to put up, you know, what you're blaming us for AIDS. We're not going to do it. I mean, this is really, and so I heard about it, about the meeting. Um, and again, they didn't want the story. Uh, you know, people heard I was going to do a story. Oh, don't do this. You can't even talk about the bathhouse. So I just did a story. And at the beginning, I wasn't for closing the bathhouses. I didn't, but I just thought it was an issue that you had to, t you couldn't talk about this disease and not talk about bathhouses. I used to go there. I know what happened. And uh, I worked in the bathhouses one of my summers in college in, in Portland. I mentioned to a few people along the way that I would be interviewing you for this book. People have very strong feelings about you. Yeah. Why? Well, it's funny because people say, oh, you must like controversy, and I hate it. I hate being, I'm very sensitive, and I, my feelings get very easily hurt, and uh, so they're hurt a lot. And then some of the stuff that comes, I mean, I've lived my whole adult life being open about being gay, and then I get people ha hassling me who are, who've never, if we're being an Uncle Tom or something, or being, what, self-hating gay, that's what they do. And I just think, my God, you've never, you know, these people have never had anything comparable to, to, to being, you know, living the kind of very public gay life that I have. It just gets me mad, you know. I would be better if I didn't. Uh, sometimes I do internalize it too much. I spend a lot of time with my therapist over we're talking That's about. It's a good thing to, to, to have one. I would, be, I would be worried if you didn't, given, yeah. given the, the position you've been in. No, I don't get any better. But then on the other part of me thinks, well, I think the reason my writing is good when I do the important stuff is that I'm se that I have the sensitivity comes out and I'm able to draw, you know, if I became an asshole, if I became a thick-skinned about that, that I'd be thick-skinned in my writing and I wouldn't be as sensitive to you. You still have a heart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How do you like being a celebrity? Oh, it's weird. It's just weird. <laughs> It's really, it's interesting being a gay celebrity and being, so it's interesting. Today I was in buying my washer dryer for my house at the river. And the straight guy has a wedding ring on and this is Santa Rosa in the mm -hmm. appliance store. And, and so he was writing down the, my name from the credit card and he said, well, you're not the Randy Schultz. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, oh yeah. And he said, the author? Gee. And it was, it was like, and it was, and it's, it's what's interesting is that, uh, and I haven't quite got, it's like the people don't see me as being a famous queer. They see me as being famous, which that's what blows me away. Because I would have expected the gay thing to be much more overriding. But, um, uh, and maybe that's just because it's not as shocking to be gay anymore. The yeah. intro now is best-selling author Randy Schultz yeah. as opposed to gay reporter. Gay, and it always used to be, in fact, people used to joke that my whole, that I should get my name changed to gay reporter Randy Schultz because it was always this four-word <laughs> unit, you know, and now it's best-selling author and it's lots more respectability than I ever thought I'd ever have. By the time I left Randy's house, I was spent. He was intense. But I also had a new friend and mentor. Randy encouraged me to call whenever I needed help. And I did, several times, when I hit a wall with my book and needed a pep talk. Randy was also generous with his research and shared with me a big box filled with FBI documents that he'd secured through the Freedom of Information Act. One of those documents corroborated Frank Kameny's story about the FBI showing up at the 1961 organizational meeting for the Mattachine Society of Washington, D.C. It was all spelled out in the report in black and white. What Randy didn't share was that he was HIV positive by then. He'd found out in 1985, but he waited more than seven years after a collapsed lung landed him in the hospital to share his AIDS diagnosis with the world. According to the Los Angeles Times, Randy kept his diagnosis secret for fear it would detract from his role as a reporter on AIDS issues. He said, every gay writer who tests positive ends up being an AIDS activist. 
I wanted to keep on being a reporter. I remember wondering at the time about Randy's decision to keep his diagnosis under wraps and feeling troubled by how defensive his explanation was. What was much more troubling was a made-up key protagonist in And the Band Played On. The person was real. He was a French-Canadian flight attendant by the name of Gaetan Dugas. But Gaetan's role as patient zero, as Randy characterized him, an HIV superspreader who traveled the U.S. like a typhoid Mary Johnny Appleseed, was false. A recent documentary called Killing Patient Zero examines the story in sad detail. It was explosive publicity about Patient Zero that helped propel Randy's book onto bestseller lists. I can only speculate that Randy's profound wish for success and fame undermined his better journalistic instincts. Randy Schultz died from complications of AIDS on February 17, 1994. He was 42 and survived by his partner, Barry Barbieri. Randy's memorial service program included a final message to his critics, a quote from a letter Randy wrote to The Advocate magazine a month before he died that read, And while we're talking conclusions, hopefully history will record that I was a hell of a nice guy and that the people who have criticized me are a bunch of fools and bimbos. Randy was indeed a hell of a nice guy, at least to me. The rest is complicated. Many thanks to everyone who makes Making Gay History, including story editor Inga Dataya, associate producer Ali Lemer, audio engineer Catherine Cook, researcher Brian Faree, photo editor Michael Green, and our social media producers Christiana Pena and Nick Porter. Special thanks to our founding editor and producer Sarah Burningham and our founding production partner Jenna Weiss Berman. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Thank you to the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division for their assistance, and thank you to Con Edison for their generous support of our education work. Season 10 of this podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Calamus Foundation, the Kipper Family Foundation, Christopher Street Financial, Mary Cadigan and Lee Wilson, Brian, Christine, and Alex White, and scores of other individual supporters. Head to makinggayhistory.com where you'll find all our previous episodes, archival photos, full transcripts, and additional information on each of the people and stories we feature. And to keep up with what we're doing, sign up for our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please keep those five-star iTunes ratings coming so more people can discover our proud history through the voices of the people who lived it. I'm Eric Marcus. So long, and until next time.